Let's take a quick look back at the key points you need to know about the United Kingdom of Great Britain. The United Kingdom is a political and economic union that consists of four member countries, including England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Its form of currency is the pound. The United Kingdom is considered by many as one of the shining symbols of democracy in world history. The UK is considered a consolidated democracy, which means it has a long-standing tradition of democratic principles, including free and open elections with widespread voting rights, high levels of political competition and transparency, and widespread legitimacy from within its people of the beliefs of democracy from people of all social and economic classes. The UK is a constitutional monarchy, meaning that the Queen is in power, but her power is mostly that of a figurehead, not a direct policymaker, though the title of their government is Her Majesty's Government. The UK really became a shining symbol of democracy with the signing of the Magna Carta back in 1215, one of the first documents in world history in which the government gave up some of its authority to create a more democratic and prosperous society. Though the United Kingdom does not have one formal constitution, it does have a series of federal laws, both statutory and administrative, that guide its structure and its overall policy-making processes. The UK legal system is based on the idea of common law, which uses old legal precedents and codes that have been long withstanding to help hold up new legal terms. From some of the earliest monarchies, Great Britain was able to become one of the world's first hegemonic powers, meaning that it owned colonies throughout the world and dominated global trade patterns. It was in large part due to the Industrial Revolution that Great Britain was able to become an economic superpower. Brits of all social classes were elevated by the advances in technology. Well into the early 1920s, the British Empire was the largest in the world. However, in the coming decades, changing global markets, the demands for sovereignty throughout the world, and a wave of economic globalization led to massive decolonization in the 20th century that would leave the UK in a very difficult predicament economically. The United Kingdom, like many other European countries, was devastated by the effects of World War II. Thus, the labor government that came into place in the late 1940s and into the 1950s began purchasing up many formerly privately owned industries and putting them under government control to try to steer the economy in a more centralized and socialized way through a policy known as collectivism. It rested on the old economic principles of Keynesianism that thought that the government could actually steer economic prosperity. But by the 1970s, high inflation and high unemployment led many to believe that collectivism was outdated. The conservative government under the Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher adopted a totally different economic strategy known as monetarism, in which the conservatives began assuming a natural unemployment rate, deregulating many aspects of the economy, and decreased the welfare state. This included less government-owned industries, more private sector ownership, and more reliance on global financial markets. They also highly denounced the influence of trade unions, believing that unions were driving up the price of doing business. In 1973, the United Kingdom joined the European Union in an effort to reduce trade barriers with its European allies. However, since that time, a series of events have taken place that have created friction between the UK and the European Union. Some of the reasons for this tension includes the UK's refusal to adopt the euro, which is now the currency of all member states of the EU. The cozy relationship formed between the United Kingdom and the United States has also been an area of controversy, particularly under Tony Blair's new Labour government, that agreed to support the U.S. efforts in the Iraq War. The policies passed by the EU also many times threaten the parliamentary sovereignty that is so near and dear to British hearts. Also, the conservative approach that the U.K. has taken in comparison to its more socialist European allies in terms of the reduction of the welfare state has also caused friction between the U.K. and many other European countries. Without question, the most renowned government-owned industry that still exists today in the United Kingdom is that of the National Health Service, or NHS. It is the publicly funded health care plan for all British citizens that enjoys support from all political parties within the UK and has been around since the end of World War II. However, it has become an issue of much political scrutiny in recent years. The onset of devolution has actually taken much of the regulations of the NHS out of the hands of the federal government and down to subnational levels. Also in recent years, requests to cut the budget of the NHS is reflecting the growing need to get a control over the budget deficits that exist in this country through extreme austerity measures. Since the onset of the global financial crisis in 2008, it has been nearly impossible to talk about British politics without discussing the economic policy of austerity. In economics, austerity is a set of policies that a government may take to try to reduce its budget deficits usually done through some combination of spending cuts and tax increases. 
After the 2010 UK elections, a hung parliament resulted in the formation of a coalition government between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. This is a very rare occurrence and a phenomenon in British politics, as typically either the Conservatives or Labour have been able to get a majority of the seats in the House of Commons. A huge part of the economic plan of the Conservatives and Liberal Dems during their coalition was to try to get control over the budget deficits. The austerity measures that they implemented included cuts to the National Health Service, cuts in national pensions, raised income taxes, and some raised student tuition rates. Coming to terms with its reduced roles in economic superpower is just one of the many challenges that the United Kingdom faces moving forward in the 21st century. Combating terrorism globally and domestically is one of those challenges, as the UK has been forced to take on radical Islamist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIL in the Middle East, while also dealing with domestic terrorism from groups particularly in Northern Ireland. Instances of hate crimes and discrimination against Muslims in the UK has continuously been on the rise since the 9-11 attacks in the United States, and particularly since the 7-7 bombings of London in 2005. The UK is also dealing with clashes of its national identity, as British citizens come to terms with who they really are in a post-hegemonic, post-decolonization world that has created a more ethnically diverse UK. This has resulted in more inequalities in housing, jobs, and legal treatment within the country. Also, secessionist movements, like that of last year's Scottish secessionist movement, have also rattled the foundations of what it means to be a British citizen. And, of course, economic policy clashes with the European Union continue to define EU monetary policy as well as UK monetary policy. For anyone who is seeking to understand British policymaking, there is no more important or long-standing principle of British government than that of parliamentary sovereignty also referred to by some as the Westminster model of government, referring to the meeting place of the UK Parliament. Parliamentary sovereignty is a system in which the ultimate authority of policymaking rests within the hands of the legislative branch. Parliament is given the ultimate authority to make or overturn any law without the threat of a check from an executive veto or judicial review. Parliamentary systems of government differ from those of the United States' presidential system, Unlike the United States, the British people do not get to directly elect their head of government. Instead, that person is selected from within the majority party of the House of Commons following a UK general election. The Prime Minister and their entire government, also known as their cabinet, can be removed by a vote of no confidence from within the legislature. So again, unlike in the United States, which utilizes a presidential system, where voters actually get to select Congress members and a separate president, in a parliamentary system, the voters are selecting only their members of parliament. Once the election is over, the majority party is able to select who will be the next chief executive or prime minister. Just like the United States Congress, the British Parliament is considered a bicameral legislature because it has two chambers, a lower house, the House of Commons, and an upper house known as the House of Lords. By far the more integral policy-making component is that of the House of Commons, which consists of 650 popularly elected members from single-member pluralities. The House of Commons is the major arena for all policy-making and debate, as it selects the head of government, the Prime Minister, from within its majority party, and the Cabinet, all elected MPs as well, to the House of Commons. The House of Commons handles all major policy areas, including taxation, the federal budget, the military, and much more. The House of Lords, on the other hand, is a combination of some elected positions, but most who get it through heredity. They are required to hear and debate all pieces of legislation, but their approval is not needed before a royal assent. The House is mainly used as a revisionist chamber, which used to have the functionality of being the highest court in the land. It has been made slightly more democratic with a few elected positions as part of the reforms that were put in place in the 1990s by Tony Blair's New Labour. The second principle of British democracy is that of a unitary system of government. In a unitary system, power becomes heavily centralized in the hands of the national government only, allowing for very little sovereignty for subnational levels. However, this can come at high costs and at a lot of difficulty in being able to enforce policies throughout the nation in the same manner. Thus, during the 1990s, Tony Blair's New Labour introduced the policy of devolution. With devolution, many powers were delegated or handed down to subnational levels. Because of this, the Scots, Northern Irish, and Welsh now have their own national assemblies in which they can take care of policies such as health care, education, law enforcement, and infrastructure, to name a few. The third principle of British democracy is that of the concept of cabinet government, and what this means is that with cabinet government, the Prime Minister is responsible for putting together a cabinet of other elected MPs whom they will share a collective responsibility in policy making. 
In essence, the Prime Minister and his or her cabinet are a policy-making team that success or failure of policies will hold a group responsibility. One of the more prominent positions within the cabinet of the UK is that of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. This person is responsible for the nation's treasury. Modern Prime Ministers have challenged cabinet government, however, as they've taken on more unilateral power, oftentimes ignoring their cabinet's requests or excluding them from policy-making decisions completely. Perhaps no better example of this existed in 2003, when new Labor Prime Minister Tony Blair decided to support American President George W. Bush in the Iraq War, despite disapproval from many of his cabinet members and other elected MPs. The fourth and final principle of British democracy is the concept of fusion of powers, which is a stark contrast from the American system of separation of powers. Under the British system, the executive and legislative branches fall together under a blanket system in which they are forced to work together to get policy making through. The hope is that it creates a more consensus style of governance and less frustration and gridlock. All members of the executive branch, including cabinet members, are also elected MPs from the House of Commons, including the leader of the majority party, the Prime Minister. However, make no mistake that it is Parliament who will hold more authority than the Prime Minister in his or her cabinet. The principle of collective governing responsibility, along with the ability to remove the Prime Minister and his or her entire cabinet through a vote of no confidence, is designed to make sure that the legislative branch, or the Westminster model, is consistently followed. In 2009, the United Kingdom stripped the House of Lords away from one of its more prominent powers, that of being the highest ranking court in the country. They created their own UK Supreme Court, which has the ability to review lower court decisions and also check policies that are passed by Parliament for being consistent with policies of the European Union. However, unlike its US counterpart, the UK Supreme Court is not given the power of judicial review. That, of course, is the power to declare an act by Congress or the President is unconstitutional. Staying consistent with the belief in parliamentary sovereignty, the Supreme Court is excluded from being able to strike down a law that is passed by Parliament. All comparative government students should know the difference between the terms head of state and head of government. The UK is a prime example of a country that has opposing heads of state versus heads of government. The head of state is usually the ceremonial figure or the person who brings about national unity. They may at times have some foreign policy responsibilities, but are not necessarily going to be involved in day-to-day -day governance. For example, Her Majesty the Queen is considered the head of state in the UK. Most of her roles are ceremonious, but not directly linked to governing. The head of government, however, in the UK is the Prime Minister. The head of government is usually the person who is shaping policy directly on a daily basis and is often responsible for domestic issues, though they may also have some foreign policy responsibility. Thanks to a 2011 law passed by the Conservative and Liberal Democrat Coalition, elections in the United Kingdom are now on set five-year cycles. They can be altered in some extreme circumstances. The elections are held for every member who will sit in the House of Commons. The members are elected by what is known as a first-past-the-post voting system, in which the candidate with the highest percentage of votes becomes the only legislator to represent that district. Thus, we say that it is a single-member plurality system. This means that only one member can represent each district, and it is the member who gets the highest percentage of votes, even if that person does not get over 50% of the vote. The result of this type of system oftentimes, much like that of the U.S., exaggerates the margin of victory for the mainstream parties that have more national recognition. Though the United Kingdom should probably be considered a multi-party system with an increased representation in third parties, it is still considered by most political scientists to be a two-party system. That is because that the two mainstream parties, the Conservatives and Labour, have pretty much held control of the House of Commons in each election since the end of World War II. Between these two parties, they receive over 85% of nationwide votes in general elections. Starting in the 1990s, the Labour Party felt that it needed to rebrand itself to stay competitive with the more traditionally popular Conservative Party. Because of this, the policy differences between these two mainstream parties have shrunken greatly. Unlike in the United States, where the Republican and Democratic parties have become more and more polarized from each other, the Conservatives and Labour Party have come together to share a similar philosophy on issues of the economy, the environment, and trying to control budget deficits through austerity measures. Thus today, elections are more heavily placed in emphasis on the personality of the candidate, more so than ideological differences between the two mainstream parties. The greatest outcome that we have seen of the Conservative Party and Labour parties coming together on economic policies is that there's far less class-based voting than there used to be. UK elections used to be highly predictable because the voting factor was oftentimes determined by the social and economic classes of the people who were voting. 
Because the Tories and Labour today have pulled support from both ends of the spectrum, the personality of the candidates running is much more of a large determiner on which party is going to take over the House of Commons. Modern third parties are challenging the established status quo of the Conservatives and Labour. In Scotland, the rise of the SNP, fueled by a desire to break away from the UK in 2014, has made the SNP one of the largest third parties in the country, even though the SNP only runs candidates within Scotland. The Liberal Democrats have been one of the largest emerging third parties in the UK, as they've burst onto the scene in the 1970s with support from a lot of younger Brits. And of course, the Plaid Cymru in Wales has also become a more nationalist sentiment party. All three of these parties, trying to make a name for themselves in British politics, have been the most likely to team up with the European Union to try to gain support. The relationship with the EU has traditionally been rocky with the two mainstream parties, but as these third parties gain support from younger British voters, who oftentimes have a large sentiment with the more socialized European countries, it is more likely that a third party would buddy up to the European Union than the Conservatives or Labour. As you can see from the results of the 2015 general election in the UK, voting today is oftentimes far more determined regionally than it is by class, with the Conservative Party typically doing its best in England and close to the main federal region in London. The Labour Party tends to do better in rural areas, where the SNP tends to dominate in its home country of Scotland. Region, by far, tends to determine the outcome of these elections far more than class today because of the ideological merging of mainstream parties. Just as in the United States, interest groups referred to as pressure groups in the UK do exist and do compete for access to members of the House of Commons. The goal of pressure group or interest group is to try to gain access to legislators in hopes that they will set aside a policy agenda that is consistent with that particular group. The UK is considered what political scientists would call a pluralist system. This is a system in which many groups have the opportunity to compete for access with no one group having a significant advantage as none of the groups have a direct influence over policy making. Consistent with its strong democratic roots, British citizens enjoy a strong civil society. In political science, we refer to the term civil society when talking about the role that non-formal groups, unlike interest groups, play in affecting the policy agenda. These are groups of common citizens who have the opportunity to come together at will and have their voice heard in the political system. In more authoritarian type countries like China and Russia, civil society is typically heavily controlled and censored by the state. But in the UK, many civil society groups have emerged and flourish as their voice is typically going to play a large role in the policies that are proposed. In recent years, we've seen environmental groups have a large influence as well as student rights groups and civil liberty groups, while the influence of trade unions has steadily gone down.